Hi everyone. So today we're looking at part uh, the next part in Black Beauty. Uh, so we're going to read two chapters and then there'll be a quiz on Purple Mash for you. If you hear any noises about the place, the dogs and the cats are having a mad time of it and running around everywhere. So they'll probably join in at some point. Um, right, let's get started. I don't know about you, but I've been looking forward to hearing what happens to him. Part four. 46. Jake's and the Lady. I was sold to a corn dealer and baker whom Jerry knew, and with him he thought I should have a good have good food and fair work. In the first he was quite right, and if my master had always been on the premises, premises, I do not think I should have been overloaded. But there was a foreman who was always hurrying and driving every one, and frequently, when I had quite a full load, he would order something else to be taken on. My name was Jake. I ought to take, but the other always overruled him. It was no use going twice when once would do, and he chose to get business forward. Well, that's interesting because that's what we call a lazy man's load. If you take too much stuff in the one go instead of just coming back for a second go. Jake's, like the other carters, always had the check rein up, which prevented me from drawing easily, and by the time I had been there three or four months, I found the work telling very much on my strength. One day I was loaded more than usual and part of the road was a steep uphill. I used all my strength but I could not get on and was obliged continually to stop. This did not please my driver and he laid his whip on badly. Get on you lazy fellow or I'll make you. Again I started the heavy load and struggled on a few yards. Again the whip came down and again I struggled forward. The pain of that great cart whip was sharp but my mind was hurt quite as much as my poor sides. To be punished and abused when I was doing my very best and so hard was so hard it took the heart out of me. A third time he was flogging me cruelly when a lady stepped quickly up to him and said in a sweet earnest voice, Oh, pray do not whip your good horse any more. I'm sure he's doing all he can, and the road is very steep. I'm sure he's doing his best. If he's doing his, if doing his best won't get this load off, he must do something more than his best. That's all I know, ma'am, said Jakes. But is it not a heavy load? Yes, yes, too heavy, he said. But that's not my fault. The foreman came just as we were starting and would have 300 weight more put up on to save him trouble. And I must get on with it as well as I can. He was raising the whip again when the lady said, Pray stop, I think I can help if you will let me. The man laughed. You see, she said, you do not give him a fair chance. He cannot use all of his power with his head held back as it is, with that check rein. If you should take it off, I'm sure he would do better. Do try it, she said persuasively. I should be very glad if you would. Well, well, said Jakes with a short laugh. Anything to please a lady, of course. How far would you wish it down now? Right down, give him his head altogether. The rain was taken off, and in a moment I put my head down to my very knees. What a comfort it was. Then I tossed it up and down several times to get the aching stiffness out of my neck. Poor fellow, that is what you wanted, she said she, breaking his gentle hand. And now if you speak kindly to him and lead him on, I believe he will be able to do better. Jakes took the, took the rain. Come on, Blackie. I put my head put down my head and threw my whole weight against the collar. I spared no strength, but the load moved on, and I pulled steadily up the hill and then stopped to take breath. The lady had walked along the, along the footpath and now came across into the road. She stroked and packed... Quite willing. I can't use check reins now. Our carriage horses have not worn them for 15 years and work with much less fatigue than those who have them. Besides, she added in a very serious voice, we have no right to distress any of God's creatures without a very good reason. We call them dumb animals, and so they are, for they cannot tell us how they feel. But they do not suffer unless because they have no words. I'm trying my plan. Across the path, and I saw her no more. 
That was a real lady. work but no horse can stand against overloading and I was getting so thoroughly pulled down from this cause that a younger horse was brought in my place. I may as well mention here that I had suffered what I had suffered at this time from another cause. I'd heard horses speak of it but had never myself experienced of the evil. This was a, a badly lighted stable. There was only one very small window at the end and the consequence was that all the stalls were almost dark. Besides the depressing effect this had on my spirit it very much weakened my sight, and when I was suddenly brought out of the darkness into the glare of the daylight, it was very painful to my eyes. Several times I stumbled over the threshold and could scarcely see where I was going. I believed, had I stayed there very long, I should have become pure blind, and that would have been a great misfortune, for I've heard a man sa men say that a stone-blind horse was, a, was safer to drive than one which had imperfect sight, as it generally makes them very timid. However, I escaped without any permanent injury to my sight and was sold to a large cab owner. Well, it sounds good that Black Beauty managed to escape from that because that sounds like an awful situation. I wonder who it reminds us of that they haven't used check reins for so long. Who else in the story didn't use check reins and disagreed with them? If you remember, way back when we started the book. Chapter 47. Hard times. My new master, I shall never forget. He had black eyes and a hooked nose. His mouth was as full of teeth as a bulldog's and his voice was as harsh as the grindle of grinding of cartwheels over graveled stones. His name was Nicholas Skinner and I believe he was the man that gave poor C.D. Sam that the man that poor C.D. Sam drove for. I've heard men say that seeing is believing but I say that feeling is believing. From what much as I had seen before I never till knew till now the utter misery of a cab horse's life. Skinner had a low set of cabs and a low set of drivers. He was hard on the men and the men were hard on the horses. In his pl this place we had no Sunday rest and it was in the heat of summer. Sometimes on a Sunday morning a party of fast men would hire a cab for the day, four of them inside and another with the driver, and I had to take them 10 or 15 miles out into the country and back again. Never would any of them get down to walk up a hill, let it be ever so, st let it be ever so steep or the day ever get so ever so hot unless indeed when the driver was afraid I could not ma I should not manage it and sometimes I was so fevered and worn that I could hardly touch my food how I used to long for the nice bran mash with with nitre in, in it that Jerry used to give us on Saturdays Saturday nights in hot weather that used to cool us down and make us so comfortable then we had two nights and a whole day for unbroken rest and on Monday morning we were as fresh as young horses again but here there was no rest and my driver was just as hard as his master. He had a cruel whip with something so sharp at the end that it sometimes drew blood and he would even whip me up under the belly and flip the lash out at my head. Indignities like these took the heart out of me terribly, but still I did my best and never hung back, for as poor Ginger has said, it was no use, men as the strongest. Well, this is not very happy at all. My life was so utterly wretched that I wished I might, like Ginger, drop down dead at my work and be out of my misery. And one day my wish very nearly came to pass. I, was on, I went on the stand at eight in the morning and had done a good share of work when we had taken a fare, a fare to the railway. A long train was expected, so my driver pulled up at the back of some of the outside cabs. The kitten is having a fine time, which is a, keeping my spirits up because this is a very sad pair of chapters. And I think it's awfully sad that Black Beauty's just wished himself dead. Um, it was a very heavy train, and as all the cabs were soon engaged, ours was called for. There was a party of four, a noisy, blustering man with a lady, a little boy and a young girl, and a great deal of your luggage. The lady and the boy got into the cab, and while the man ordered about the luggage, the young girl came up and looked at me. Papa, she said, I am sure this poor horse cannot take us and all our luggage so far. He is so very weak and worn up. Do look at him. Oh, he's all right, miss, said my driver. He's strong enough. The porter, who was pulling about some heavy boxes, suggested to the gentleman, as there was so much luggage, whether he would not take a second cab. Oh, he's been doing all right, sir. Send up the boxes, porter. You can take more than that. 
and out the hall I had up at Box J headed that I could hear the spins go down. Papa, Papa, do take a second coat, said the younger. I'm sure we are wrong. I'm sure it is very cruel. Nonsense, Grace. Get in at once and don't make it all this fuss. A pretty thing it would be of a man of business. My gentle friend had to obey, and box after box was dragged up and lodged, lodged on the top of the cab or settled down the, by the side of the driver. At last, all was ready, and with the usual jerk of the rein and the flash of the whip, he drove out of the station. The load was very heavy, and I had neither food nor rest in the, since morning, but I did my best as I had always done in spite of cruelty and injustice. I got along fairly well till we came to Ludgate Hill, but the, air, the heavy load and my own exhaustion were too much. I was struggling to keep on, goaded by constant touch of the rain and the use of the whip when in a single moment, I cannot tell how, my feet slipped from under me and I fell heavily to the ground on my side. The suddenness and the force with which I fell seemed to beat all the breath out of my body. I lay perfectly still. Indeed, I had no power to move and I thought now I was going to die. I thought now I was going to die. I heard a sort of confusion around me, loud, angry voices, and then a sweet, pitiful voice saying, Oh, that poor horse, it is all our fault. Someone came and loosened the throat strap of my bridle and undid the traces which kept the collar so tight upon me. Someone said, He's dead. He'll never get up again. Then I could hear a policeman giving orders, but I did not even open my eyes. I could only draw a gasping breath now and then. Some cold water was thrown over my head and some cordial was poured into my mouth, so cordial squash, and something was covered over me. I cannot tell how long I lay there, but I found myself coming back and a very and a kind voiced man was patting me and encouraging me to rise. After some more cordial had been given to me, so they've given him that because it's full of lots of sugar, and after one or two attempts I staggered to my feet and was gently led to some stables which were close by. Here I was put into a well-littered st littered stall with some warm gruel was brought to me, which I drank, thankfully. In the evening, I was sufficiently recovered to be led back to Skinner Stable. He will be able to work again, but now there is not an ounce of strength left in him. Then he must go to the dogs, said Skinner. I have no meadows to nurse sick horses in. He might get well or he might not. That sort of thing don't suit my business. My plan is to work them as long as they'll go and then sell them for what they'll fetch at the knackers or elsewhere. The knackers yard is where they used to, is what you'll have heard people talk about with um, horses and it's where they send old horses to be killed for dog food and that sort of thing. Not really, I mean, doesn't really happen as much anymore. If he was broken-winded, said the farrier, you would better have him killed out of hand, but he is not. There is a sale of horses coming up in about, coming off in about ten days. If you rest him and feed him up, he may pick up, and you may get more than his skin is worth at any rate. Upon this advice, Skinner, rather unwillingly, I think, gave orders that I should be well fed and cared for, and the stable man, happily for me, carried out the orders with a much better will than his master had given had in giving them. Ten days of perfect rest, plenty of good oats, hay, bran mashes with boiled linseed mixed in them, did more to get up my condition than anything else could have done. Those linseed mashes were delicious, and I began to think, after all, it might be better to live than to go to the dogs. When the twelfth day after the accident came, I was taken to a sale a few miles out of London. I had felt... I felt that any change from my present place must be an improvement, so I held up my head and hoped for the best. So there we go. We've had a look at the next part of Black Beauty. I'm really looking forward to see where it goes because, it, I mean, those two chapters were um, quite hard going uh, with, with all of Black Beauty's misfortune at the hands of people again. Um, and I'm hopeful that maybe he'll find somewhere nice to live now um but he is getting very old and he's he's not much got an awful lot left in him i don't think that he'd be able to to give so he can't be a cat if you remember he started out as a um working for uh the farm um with john and everyone he was he was really well treated and then he was sold to the rich gentleman um where he wasn't well treated and then he's been sold on and on and on each time. And he was looked after well with Jerry, but now he's been sold again to 
more characters who aren't very nice. So there's a quiz on um, Purple Mash. Have a go at that. Um, you did really well yesterday, those of you that did the true and false. So see how you get on. And I'll be back tomorrow with the next two chapters. And let's hope that Black Beauty ends up in a nice place. <laughs>